Thanks, Natalie, for the introduction. Um, so today I'll be talking about some of my work on ambient intelligence in AI-assisted healthcare spaces. I'd like to start first by talking about a major problem that's happening right now in healthcare, burnout. Burnout of our healthcare providers. As our, our aging population continues to grow, and as healthcare continues to get increasingly complex, Burnout in physicians and in nurses is becoming the new normal, affecting 78% of physicians and 62% of nurses. This can have severe consequences in environments like hospitals, where highly complex care takes place. Studies show that burned out doctors are two times more likely to make medical errors, and overworked nurses are associated with a 40% increase in the risk of patient death. I believe that artificial intelligence, AI, has the potential to make a big difference in tackling this problem. If we look at other industries like driving, we're already beginning to see the potential of AI in providing constant awareness and untiring assistance to fatigued humans who are susceptible to error. And so this naturally leads to the question, can we leverage AI to provide much needed assistance to burnt out physicians and nurses? I believe a key piece of the answer lies in the physical space of healthcare delivery. If we look at these physical spaces where healthcare is actually being executed, our hospitals, our clinics, our assisted living facilities, these have remained largely unchanged for decades. And so the goal of my research is to endow these healthcare spaces with ambient intelligence. In other words, to turn them into intelligent environments where AI can be used to assist with complex care. So first, what exactly is ambient intelligence? Well, this term was first coined by Roll Piper of Philips in 1999, where he described it as following. The future will be one where our environment satisfies our needs, mostly without our having to think about it. The intelligence is ambient, much like the light in this room. And if we think about an environment like a hospital, we can see ambient intelligence as being provided through visual sensors that are embedded in the environment and that can perceive and interpret what's happening across a hospital at every moment in time and use that to assist with clinical care. Now, what's needed to achieve this? Well, the first step is to actually build this sensing capability into environments like hospitals. Hospitals now are simply not equipped for ambient intelligence they're not capturing the visual data that would allow automatic recognition of the activities that are happening. And so to begin, we need to add visual sensors to a hospital that can provide the sensing capability. Second, once we've done that, we need to tackle the main technical challenges of developing the computer vision algorithms to be able to recognize all of the activities that are happening. A key ingredient of this is visual understanding of human activity being able to recognize and to, and to interpret what people are doing at every moment in time. This is a core problem in the computer vision community more broadly, and it's also the main technical focus of my research. So over the course of my PhD, which I also completed here at Stanford, we implemented this vision for ambient intelligence sensing and practice at two partner hospitals at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford and at Intermountain LDS Hospital in Utah. And in each of these, we equipped a pilot hospital unit with about 50 visual sensors in both patient rooms and corridors. Our first collaboration was with LPCH and started in December of 2013 at the beginning of my PhD. It took about a year to set up the project and to get the necessary approvals. And then once the sensors arrived, it took about another year and a half to go room to room and to physically complete the installation. At our second site of Intermountain, we were able to leverage the presidents of the first site in order to achieve a much faster installation at just over a year in total. So these are some, some photos showing examples of the sensors mounted in our pilot installation units. And we chose to use privacy-preserving depth sensors, which collect these silhouette-looking images that are based on distance to the sensor, such as this example shown here on the right. And here are some examples of the depth data streaming in from across the unit at LPCH. 
Now, in the remainder of this talk, I'd like to briefly highlight some pilot studies of ambient intelligence that we've pursued with our collaborators. The first of these is monitoring hand hygiene protocol compliance, which is an important factor in the prevention of hospital-acquired infections. And this was joint work with our collaborators at Stanford, LPCH, and Intermountain. So in this study, our objective was to be able to recognize when people are performing hand hygiene, in other words, when they're using the hand hygiene dispenser, and also to be able to recognize when they're doing it, whether they're doing it when they should be. And so in order to do this, we took a deep learning approach and trained a convolutional neural network to recognize instances of the hand hygiene action in depth images. But there were some additional technical challenges that we needed to consider. The first is that these depth images can capture the scene from very diverse viewpoints due to physical mounting constraints of mounting these sensors. And so in order to address this, we used a convolutional neural network model for recognition, but importantly, we extended it to be able to be robust to these diverse viewpoints. A second challenge is that what we ultimately care about is actually compliance, whether people are performing hand hygiene when they should be. And we can define compliance here as performing hand hygiene before entering a patient room, but the act of hand hygiene itself doesn't need to happen right next to the patient room. And so this requires being able to track across sensors. And so in order to address this challenge, uh, we combined our algorithm for hand hygiene detection together with a method to track people's movement across sensor views. And what we found was that our algorithm for hand hygiene detection works very well in practice. Um, I've shown here a two-hour window of time and the, high, the hand hygiene events that are detected in one hospital unit. And what we can see here is that our algorithm in the fourth row um, is able to perform very close to the ground truth at the bottom, and also that it takes up to four or more human observers to be able to match the algorithm. Now, using our method for tracking human movement, the tracks around a unit look something like this where you can see people moving in and out of patient rooms. And so now putting everything together, we can tag a person as being compliant, uh, the example on the left, if they use a hand hygiene dispenser here be before entering the patient room, whereas on the right, the algorithm tags this person as being non-compliant because they walk directly into the patient room without using a hand hygiene dispenser. So we've seen how ambient intelligence can be used to monitor hand hygiene in a way that's 24-7, that's, that's untiring, and at essentially no human cost. But now, how can we expand from detecting the single action to being able to recognize the many clinical activities that happen in complex environments like the ICU? And so this leads to our second pilot study, recognizing patient mobilization activities, which takes the first step in this direction. And this is joint work with collaborators at Stanford and Intermountain. So in, in environments like the ICU, nurses will periodically perform uh, patient mobilization activities for patients who are able to start moving around a little bit. And this can include things like getting a patient out of bed, transferring them to a chair, moving them back into bed, and so on. Studies have shown that early patient mobilization is important for preventing complications like ICU-acquired weakness and prolonged hospital stay. And so in, in our work, our goal was to develop an algorithm that could automatically recognize these patient mobilization activities in depth data. In order to do this, we can take a deep learning approach as before, but here we have this additional challenge of how can we distinguish between multiple fine-grained activities that can look visually very similar. This requires rich temporal modeling of the depth data over time. And so in order to address this, in my work, I've also developed deep learning models for video recognition that address some of these challenges, uh, but I won't go into detail about these today. Instead, what I'd like to show you is that using our algorithm, we're able to produce temporal detections and timelines of activity that looks something like this, where you can see the patient being helped out of bed, uh, helped into a chair, and here someone being helped back into bed. And one thing that I want to point out here is that we can use these discernments for things like making sure that protocols are being followed. 
um, but it also is just a really rich source of data that we can use to study at scale uh, what's actually happening in hospitals and how this can correlate with things like outcomes. And we can also see that using computer vision, we're able to recognize not only that an activity has happened, but also richer characteristics, like how long the activity took or how many people were involved. This is another example here of a slightly healthier patient who uh, tried to get out of bed, changed their mind, got back in, now is getting out of bed again. Um, and is going to walk out of the room. And this might be something that would be good for nurses to know had happened. OK, now finally, I'll briefly describe a third pilot study, this, this time in a different type of healthcare environment, assisted living facilities. So in this study, we investigated activities of daily living that are important for senior well-being. Uh, and this was a joint work with collaborators at uh, Stanford and Onlock Senior Home Center in San Francisco. Um, so, so, so here, uh, we studied these activities of daily living, uh, some of these shown in, in the table here. And if we look at these, um, we can see that visual data can actually be very informative for many of these activities. And so in our collaboration, uh, we collaborated with Onlock um, to install both uh, depth as well as now thermal sensors in some of their rooms. And here are thermal sensors. Uh, these provide a complementary type of image data to the depth sensors um, that also obscures identifiable information. Here are some examples showing the multimodal sensor data that's captured, um, where on the left here we have depth images and on the right is thermal. So now using these sensors, we've developed computer vision algorithms that can produce long-term analytics of things like what is the distribution of time a patient is, is spending across different types of activities like sitting, standing, walking, sleeping, and so on. Uh, we can also investigate a particular activity in more detail. For example, how many hours of sleep each day a patient is getting. And we can produce visualizations like these spatial heat maps that show where in a patient room uh, uh, the patient is tending to spend most of their time for particular activities. And this can be useful for things like uh, detecting loitering near a window or a door, which may be a warning, a warning flag for depression or, or delirium. OK, so, so in today's talk, uh, I've briefly described our pilot implementations of ambient intelligence. Um, and some initial studies that we've uh, pursued with our collaborators. Uh, but we're only beginning to scratch the surface. And so moving forward, my goal is to be able to develop the computer vision and AI capabilities to enable us to fully harness the potential of ambient intelligence uh, broadly and deeply across a wide spectrum of clinical care. And I envision a future where ambient intelligence is going to become a core component of systems that can provide real-time assistance to overburdened nurses and physicians. And it can be a constantly aware and untiring assistant uh, that can watch for error during complex procedures, monitor patient status when doctors and nurses are not at the bedside, provide automated documentation of patient care activities, and more. And finally, I'll conclude by saying that as we approach the 2030 problem, uh, which is the year when the entire baby boomer generation is going to become senior citizens, uh, our ability to deliver quality health care to this aging population is going to become a, a serious challenge. And I believe that an important part of the solution is going to be AI-assisted healthcare spaces, where ambient intelligence fused into the environment is going to become invaluable assistants uh, and partners to clinicians and caregivers. Thank you.